from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Moreland. I'm the Assistant Chief of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division of the Library of Congress. The Humanities and Social Sciences Division provides reference service and collection development in the main and local history and genealogy reading room. Also in the microform and electronic resources reading room. And we always like to remind all of our audiences that one needs only to be 16 years of age or older and have a government issued ID to obtain a reader's card at the Library of Congress. The Humanities and Social Sciences Division regularly has programs such as the one that you will enjoy today. They are in the arts, humanities, and social science subject areas. On behalf of HSS, the Humanities and Social Sciences Division, and the Library of Congress, welcome to this afternoon's lecture by Maureen Corrigan. It is a part of our ongoing series. Abby Yokelson is the literature specialist in the Humanities and Social Sciences Division and is the lead arranger for today's program. And we also express special appreciation to Rob Casper, who is with the library's Poetry and Literature Center and is serving as a co-sponsor for this event. The Poetry and Literature Center fosters and enhances the public's appreciation of literature. The center administers the endowed chair, U.S. Poet, Poet Laureate, consultant in, liter in poetry coordinates an annual season of readings, performances, lectures, and symposia, and sponsors prizes and fellowships for literary writers. And now to introduce Ms. Corrigan, Abby Yokelson. So back in uh, 2010, a librarian I knew at Georgetown University called me and said, I'd like to send a researcher over to you. She is brilliant. She is the nicest person on our faculty, and she really appreciates libraries and librarians. And I said, great. And then she said, she's not all that good on electronic resources. Databases are in her strong suit. And her topic is uh, what people were reading, the, the sort of base of literary culture in the 1930s in New York. And I gulped and thought, all right, sounds challenging. Um, Jill was right about everything about Maureen. She is the nicest person and an ardent researcher, and it's been a delight to work with her on this project. Uh, by the time she got here, though, the topic had changed, and it was the Great Gatsby instead of that really hard one, which she says she's doing next. Um, I couldn't have been the only one who kind of rolled my eyes and said, all right, what is left to say about the Great Gatsby? I showed her our online catalog. There were 70 works of literary criticism on F. Scott Fitzgerald and another 50 just on the Great Gatsby. So I thought, all right. But we found a few other bits and pieces in the catalog that looked pretty interesting for different um, materials in the library. Um, but Maureen will tell you that she has read it uh, more than 50 times, taught it for over 20 years, and toured the country talking to all kinds of audiences for the uh, National Endowment for the Arts Big Read program. So she was pretty convinced that she did have some things to say. And the result is, and so we read on how the Gratz, Great Gatsby came to be and how it endures. Um, I'm looking around the audience. I know many of you will recognize her voice immediately from NPR's uh, Fresh Air with Terry Gross. She's a regular book critic there, and her voice is just very familiar. Someone in the lobby stopped her as a former student, and she's been teaching at Georgetown University and is the critic in residence there. She has a specialty a class in women's autobiography, and in 2005, she wrote her own, Leave Me Alone, I'm Reading, uh, 
finding and losing myself in books. It could easily be on the syllabus there if anybody else was teaching the class. Her other expertise is in detective fiction, and you will see how this has translated into aspects of The Great Gatsby. Um, she's uh, an expert, wrote a, uh, contributed and co-edited a book on uh, mystery and suspense fiction, which won the prestigious Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America. That's just like as high as you can get in the mystery field. And then others of you will certainly recognize her name from reading reviews in the Washington Post, New York Times, Village Voice. Um, and because she's such a nice person, she gets to be on lots of awards committees, like the Pulitzer Prize for 2010. Uh, I had a great quote. She's been getting unbelievable reviews, had a lovely long quote I was going to read. And then I just thought, I like this one from Michael Cunningham. Maureen Corrigan has produced a minor miracle, a book about the great Gatsby that stands up to Gatsby itself. I give you Maureen. Michael Cunningham is a very effusive and generous person. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you so much, Abby, and, and thank you for, for being here. I, I feel like, in a sense, I'm coming home because I spent so many happy days at the Library of Congress researching this book. In fact, I so felt that I was coming home that I raced over here and promptly went into the Jefferson Building because I was ready to do some more research and then had to realize, no, it's the Madison Building. I read The Great Gatsby in high school. That was my first reading of The Great Gatsby. And I'm guessing that that's where many of you first encountered The Great Gatsby. I have been teaching at Georgetown for 25 years. A lot of those classes have been freshman English classes. I can tell you with absolute certainty that Gatsby is the one novel that a freshman English professor can pretty much predict that 95%, if not 100% of her class will have read coming into the class. After that, it fragments. Catcher in the Rye, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, A Few Brave Souls Have Already Done Moby Dick, but it fragments. If we have one novel that unites us in America, it's The Great Gatsby. But as I say, I didn't care for it the first time. It really took repeated rereadings and teaching it in grad school and then beyond, going around the country, lecturing on it finally for the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read program. I fell in love with Gatsby long before that. But it, I do believe it's a novel, of course, that you have to reread in order to appreciate its greatness. Uh, my experience with Gatsby was actually paralleled by America's experience with Gatsby. And what I'm talking about is the fact that when it came out in 1925, eh, it got mixed reviews. The most famous headline of a Gatsby review was in the New York World. Fitzgerald's latest, a dud. That's, you know. But America took a second look after Fitzgerald's death in 1940. And when it took a second look in the late 40s, 50s, it too fell in love with Gatsby. And you know, as you know, the, the novel is a staple on high school English curricula and even into college. I wanted to write this book because I wanted to figure out how that happened. And in fact, I did first come to, to, to Abby Yokelson, who is one of the greatest treasures that the Library of Congress has. In addition to all of its other treasures, I would still be wandering around the stacks if it were not for Abby and wondering where to find the 1925 Publishers Weekly Review of Gatsby. Um, I, I, be, I started to think about writing a book on Gatsby because I went to see Gats, the seven-hour production of The Great Gatsby that was the hit of the 2010 theater season in New York City. If you don't know about it, Gats was literally seven, seven and a half hours of actors who had memorized the novel, kind of performing it on stage, but it was word for word perfect. I, I went to see Gats twice, and the, the first time I went to see it, I went with my husband, and after we left the theater, I was babbling, as I'll no doubt babble now, and he said to me, this is the book you should write. You love it. 
this is the book you need to write. And I, I thought, right, Gatsby, you know, what is there left to say? I could write another book on Gatsby, and, uh, and I, I'm sure there will be many books after mine to follow, and there should be. There's so much to say. I didn't just want to sit at my desk for this book and read closely, much as I love to do that. I wanted to go out on the road. So in addition to the big read events where, you know, I, I played Peoria, I went to libraries in, <laughs> in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and you know, all around the country, and met people who were mostly rereading Gatsby for the second time. I went out on Long Island Sound to take the Great Gatsby Boat Tour of Long Island Sound, which is mostly a floating tourist trap. But what it did help me see, because I'm a geographically challenged person, it did help me see those eggs, those strange formations of land that Fitzgerald writes about in the novel. They're really Great Neck and Manhasset, but they're still there. The over-the-top mansions are still there, and you see the Manhattan skyline in the distance. You see, in a way, this perfect geography of yearning that Fitzgerald was able to inscribe into the novel. Because remember, the first image that we get in the novel of Jay Gatsby, it's at the end of chapter one, is Nick Carraway looking out at night on the lawn of his cottage, and he sees his neighbor, Jay Gatsby, standing in the dark at the edge of his property stretching out his arms to the green light across the long across the, the long island sound to daisy's house daisy buchanan's house um, i think that's the signal image in the novel that image of yearning more than the green light more than the eyes of dr tj eckelberg that image of yearning of stretching out your arms farther reaching higher, running faster. That's the all-American image in the novel for me. When Fitzgerald wrote the novel, or was in the process of writing the novel, he really started in earnest in 1922. He wrote to his editor, the famous Maxwell Perkins, and he said, I want to write something odd and beautiful and intricately patterned. And boy, is it ever. It is intricately patterned. Um, there are over 450 time words in The Great Gatsby. And yes, someone has sat down and counted them. And that's, that's because the novel is very time conscious. It's aware that time is running out. You know, it's, it, the entire action of the novel is bounded by one summer in 1922, and our narrator, Nick Carraway, is thinking back to that summer, two years later, and he's aware of the ultimate deadline that awaits Jay Gatsby. I know most of you have read it, so I'm not giving anything away, that Gatsby is going to be dead by the end of that summer. It's a retrospective novel. Um, 450 time words, the obsession with color, the obsession with geography, so many symbols that have to do with hot and cold, flower symbols, Daisy Buchanan, Myrtle Wilson, the, the women in the novel, car imagery <laughs> throughout the novel, an obsession with, with cars, Jordan Baker, the other female main character, um, her name comes from two popular car models of the time, the Jordan and the Baker. Uh, another huge image that you get, or a huge symbol pattern, has to do with the debt the novel owes to hard-boiled detective fiction. You know, when The Great Gatsby came out and it got those mixed reviews, many of those mixed reviews in the popular press of the day read The Great Gatsby as a crime novel. And they kept talking about it as a tough guy crime novel. It works. Three violent deaths. Gatsby makes his money in the bootlegging business. Many of you will remember that famous meeting that Gatsby and Nick Carraway have with Meyer Wolfsheim, the character who's, who's um, patterned after Arnold Rothstein, an actual 
underworld figure of the day in the 20s, the guy who supposedly fixed the 1919 World Series, the Black Sox scandal. You go on and on and on. It's so much fun to, to kind of think about the hard-boiled influences in Gatsby. Fitzgerald uses the word hard-boiled on page two of the novel. He was a big fan of mystery fiction. In fact, the first, the first story he ever wrote for his high school magazine was a mystery. He, he went on after Gatsby to become a great fan of Dashiell Hammett and the Maltese Falcon. And Fitzgerald loved to draw up um, lists, reading lists for his friends and people he knew. I went to the University of South Carolina, which has a big Fitzgerald archive, and looked at some of these reading lists. In addition to the Odyssey, you know, romantic poetry, all of this highbrow literature that he's always recommending to people, Stendhal, the red and the black, Dashiell Hammett, The Maltese Falcon, he thought it was a masterpiece. He had an admiration for that kind of writing and also for that kind of language. One of the things I was, I was trying to figure out is what makes Gatsby so different from Fitzgerald's previous two novels. And one of the great elements that changes in Gatsby is the language. As beautiful, as unearthly as the poetry of the language is, there are also a lot of slang words in Gatsby, a lot of tough talk. And I think Fitzgerald is partly indebted to the atmosphere of the day in New York City in the early 20s, you know, putting in some of this language that we would later very much associate with hard-boiled detective fiction and the later film noirs that were made from um, those novels. By the way, the first film of Gatsby was 1926. It's a silent movie. We've lost that movie, but we've got the, the preview, the trailer for it. I watched it down in the Library of Congress's screening room, another debt I owe to the Library of Congress. The second film that was made from Gatsby came out in 1949. I also watched it here on a reel-to-reel -reel projector in the screening room. It stars Alan Ladd, and those of you who know anything about the golden age of Hollywood know Alan Ladd's career was a career largely made on tough guy roles, detectives, and then, of course, Shane. He plays Gatsby. I like him as Gatsby. He's enigmatic, handsome, and blank, which is what Gatsby should be. The first shot you see of Gatsby in that 1949 version is Alan Ladd leaning out of his speeding roadster, machine gunning down his rivals in the bootleg business. So I love that Hollywood picked up on the crime element in Gatsby. Why does it matter? You know, apart from the fact that I'm fascinated with detective fiction and film noir, it matters because of the heavy element of fate in Gatsby. You know, it's a faded story. All the events that take place in the last third of the novel are foretold. Even the fatal car crash from Myrtle Wilson is foretold by two earlier car crashes in the novel. And Nick is looking backward and telling us this story. For those of you who've ever watched Double Indemnity, The Big Sleep, The Maltese Falcon, Mildred Pierce, some of the great film noirs that we have in the American canon, all of those film noirs are narrated um, by a voiceover, by a man usually talking Sunset Boulevard about what's happened already and nothing can be changed. The events have all transpired. It's retrospective. How can this be our great American novel if it's, everything is doomed, everything is foretold? We're the people who like to believe in infinite possibility, you know, that the future can always be changed, made better, that we can transform ourselves. Not so, says the great Gatsby. It's all over before you even begin the novel. Gatsby is dead at the beginning of the novel. Tying in with that, I, I just want to mention one other image that comes up again and again in Gatsby and hasn't gotten enough appreciation, and that's the water imagery in the novel. Like so many hard-boiled detective fic uh, uh, 
novels, like so many film noirs, this novel is soaking wet. And that genre loves to play with the idea of drowning, of going under, um, of, of trying to, you know, set your sights high and being pulled under by the forces of fate, by your own past, by everything that's going to doom you. I just want to read you a short little section from my book in which I talk about the water imagery in Gatsby. The great theme running throughout all of Fitzgerald's writing and his life is the nobility of the effort to keep one's head above water despite the almost inevitable certainty of drowning. While the name of the hero in Fitzgerald's last completed novel has always struck me as comic book silly, Dick Diver bluntly spells out what Fitzgerald's work is all about. His best characters dive into life with abandon and then must fight to stay afloat. By the end of their stories, they're almost always going under, if not altogether sunk, weighted down by money worries, overwhelming desires, the burden, the burden of their own pasts. Sink or swim, it's the founding dare of America, this meritocracy where everyone, theoretically at least, is free to jump in and test the waters. The fear is, however, that if you don't make it, you'll vanish beneath the waves. So much of American literature is saturated with images of drowning, dissolving, being absorbed by the vastness of the landscape or crowds. It's our national literary nightmare. Need I do more than to start off the soggy great books parlor game than mention Moby Dick? We spend so much time on our initial high school forays into Gatsby, focusing on those look at me symbols of the green light and the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg that we overlook the most pervasive symbol of all, water. Almost every page of the novel references water. Even the briefest plot summary of it is, is soaked to the bone. James Gatz is born again as Jay Gatsby through a watery rite of passage on Dan Cody's yacht. He drowns symbolically in his pool when his dreams spring a leak and he can no longer float. Page for compact page, the great Gatsby may be our dampest exemplar of the great American novel. Fitzgerald didn't just stick his toes in the water here in this, his most perfect meditation on the American dream and its deadly undertow. He dives in and goes for broke. Those of you who've got the novel in your head, just think about that reunion scene between Gatsby and Daisy. First of all, it takes place in the dead center of the great Gatsby. That's how overly patterned this novel is, overly designed. It's raining that day. Gatsby shows up at Nick's cottage where Daisy is already inside. They're waiting to have tea. She doesn't know he's, he, Gatsby, is about to arrive. When Nick opens the door to his cottage, Jay Gatsby is standing there in his glorious pink suit, a bedraggled mess. He's a drowned man already. Daisy, she's never described as a knockout in the novel. There's one thing that marks Daisy her voice. Her voice is described as being full of money. Well, think about, think about those, those of you who've got the classical educations. Think about what are the creatures in classical mythology who lure men to their death with their voices? The sirens. The sirens. They, they call out to the sailors in Homer's Odyssey and they pull them under, they drown them with the sound of their voices. So much going on in Gatsby. And yet, as the novelist J, uh, Jonathan Franzen said, it reads so easily that you feel like you're eating whipped cream. You can read it just on the surface, and then you can read it as you know some of us who are more neurotic readers do, you know, checking off all of these symbols and, and being really astounded by the level of design in this novel. I also wanted to figure out how did it come back so quickly? 
you know, after Fitzgerald's death. He died in Hollywood in 1940, basically broke. And then the novel comes back. Certainly his high-placed literary friends had a lot of influence. People like Edmund Wilson, Malcolm Cowley, Alfred Kazin, Dorothy Parker. They worked very hard to keep Fitzgerald's name before the public. But I wanted to also see if there was a bottom-up resurgence of interest in Fitzgerald in the 40s into the 50s. And again for that, I bow before Abby because one day she, she took me down to the lower stacks in the basement of the Library of Congress, a place that's freezing, which is why I brought a sweater today because I could never anticipate what the temperature would be like in various rooms in the Library of Congress. And we spent hours down there. Imagine shelves of American literary anthologies from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and we went through the shelves, pulling down literary anthologies, trying to find out when F. Scott Fitzgerald finally gets admitted into American literary anthologies, mostly designed for high school, some for college. Hours. Our hands got coated with the, with the chemical that the library uses as part of its de acidification process. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, but it was worth it. I mean, what we, what we eventually learned, um, Fitzgerald is pretty much nowhere in the anthologies of the 40s. Hemingway is, Faulkner is, all sorts of other American writers. Very little Fitzgerald. It's not until the 50s that he really enters in in a big way. The other way, though, that he grabs the attention of the ordinary American is through an amazing program during World War II. And for knowledge of that program, I doff my hat to John Cole, who's sitting here in the front row, who is the director of the center of the book and who has written about the armed services editions during World War II. The Armed Services Editions were the product of this amazing cooperative program among publishers, paper manufacturers, editors, librarians, authors who got together in New York and who said, we want to do something for the war effort. And soldiers and sailors need books. What can we do? Eventually, they managed to get over a thousand titles, everything from Moby Dick my Friend Flicka, uh, Margaret Mead's Coming of Age in Samoa, the latest Rex Stout novel. They managed to publish them in these cheap pulp editions called Armed Services Editions. Over a million copies went out to soldiers and sailors serving overseas, as well as um, men in the prisoner of war camps in Germany and Japan through an arrangement with the Red Cross. They looked like this, and again, thank you, John. John brought in some from his own collection. This is the shape of them. They were printed on cheap pulp paper. This is a wartime Walt Whitman collection. This is the selected short stories of Sherwood Anderson, Willa Cather's O Pioneers. I'll just go ahead. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway's To Have and Have Not. Here's a thick one, a bigger one, Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. The Odyssey, Moby Dick, I mean, incredible. Gatsby was chosen in 1955, sorry, 1945. Get my date straight. Over 155,000 copies of The Great Gatsby were distributed in these armed services editions, sized to fit in servicemen's pockets. And one of the incredible things I learned researching with John's help, the armed services editions, was that the greatest distribution was on the eve of D-Day, that General Eisenhower's staff decreed that every man going over in a landing craft would have an armed services edition in his pocket. Um, one of the most popular, the most popular, of the armed services editions that were printed for D-Day was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> so it's, it's such a, I mean, it's such a feel-good program for anybody who cares about books 
and wonders about their practical purpose. They Believe me, they served a practical purpose. When you read the letters of guys afterwards talking about what these books meant to them, it's, it's so moving. So Gatsby gets distributed in a big way during World War II. And then, of course, following the war, we get the paperback revolution. We get early TV. Things like the Philco Theater picks up on the Great Gatsby and does a version. And, and it starts to really infiltrate the culture um, in, in, in such a big way. Uh, Fitzgerald, of course, knew none of this. He was dead by then. Um, he had gone out to Hollywood to work for the movies, as so many of our great writers did. And as so many of our great writers experienced, Hollywood did not have such a, a reverential respect for novelists. Um, I'm thinking of Faulkner. I'm thinking of Raymond Chandler. Oh my god, poor Raymond Chandler working with Billy Wilder uh, out in Hollywood um, on double indemnity. What a nightmare. Anyway, Fitzgerald was treated like a hand out in Hollywood. He was put on movies to work on the scripts and then pulled and you know, put on other movies. For a while, he even worked on Gone with the Wind, which um, seems like a really bad match. But I, I just wanted, wanted, you to read, uh, wanted to read a short section of... Um, of Fitzgerald in Hollywood and, and then show you quickly some photos from my research and then open things up to questions and comments because I know so many of you have a lot to say, I'm sure, about The Great Gatsby. Um, and let's see, where did that go? Yeah. Luckily, I know this book really well, so if the, uh, if the sticky note falls out, I think I can really find it quickly for you. Um, yeah. There's a, sh there's a story about Fitzgerald's Hollywood years that I can't get out of my head. Shortly after he met Sheila Graham in 1937, Fitzgerald read in the paper that the Pasadena Playhouse was presenting a stage adaptation of his short story, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz. Fitzgerald decided to put on the dog. He called the Playhouse, announced that he was the author, and reserved two seats. He also reserved a chauffeured limousine and took Sheila Graham, who he was living with at the time, in evening clothes, out to dinner and on to the theater. When they arrived, no one was in the lobby. It turned out that some students were performing the play in an upstairs hall. The upstairs hall was pretty empty too, just about a dozen or so casually dressed people, mostly the players' mothers, it seemed, in the audience. Afterward, Fitzgerald went backstage to congratulate the student players, later telling Sheila Graham, they were nice kids. I told them they'd done a good job. Anyone who loves Fitzgerald can't help but wish that he could have had a glimpse into the future. Just a couple of decades beyond his own death, he would have seen crowds of students, much like those Pasadena amateur actors, reading The Great Gatsby in college and high school classes across America. Further on, he would have seen several more Gatsby films, the operas, the ballet, and Gats. He would have seen volumes of criticism and biographies towering in piles big as the Ritz, and he would have seen the money, how he would have reveled in the money. But Fitzgerald saw none of that. In the late 1930s, he drew up a three-page list for Sheila Graham of, quote unquote, possibly valuable books in his library. That list is in Princeton's University Library, which has most of Fitzgerald's papers. The list included a first edition of The Wasteland and notes on his personal copies of his own books. At the end of page three, he writes, probable value of library at forced sale, $300. Fitzgerald's last royalty check was for $13.13. His young secretary, Francis Kroll Ring, remembered that when that final royalty statement came through from Scribner's, and this is Francis Kroll Ring speaking, the handful of sales proved that the author himself was the only purchaser. 
He told me about it, laughing bitterly. In May of 1940, Fitzgerald wrote a letter to Max Perkins in which he abruptly detoured from updates about his work in Hollywood to talk for two paragraphs about Gatsby. I think it's one of the saddest literary letters ever written. As often happens with Fitzgerald, though, there's also that eerie quality of prescience. I wish I was in print. It will be odd a year or so from now when Scotty, his daughter, assures her friends I was an author and finds that no book is procurable. Would the 25 cent press keep Gatsby in the public eye or is the book unpopular? He puts that in italics. Has it had its chance? Would a popular reissue in that series with a preface, not by me, but by one of its admirers, I can maybe pick one, make it a favorite with classrooms, professors, lovers of English prose, anybody? But to die so completely and unjustly after having, having given so much, even now, there is little published in American fiction that doesn't slightly bear my stamp. In a small way, I was an original. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking. I want to show you some, uh, a, a few pictures from the Library of Congress collections and culled from my research. This is wonderful. I was on Fresh Air last week talking about the book and a librarian, another heroic librarian, from the um, Motion Picture Arts Library out in Hollywood contacted me and said, I want to send you a still from a documentary made in 1945 about the D-Day landing. And you see, the still from that documentary is of a guy, maybe in a landing craft, I can't tell, reading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. That one of the ASC editions. Um, this is from the Fitzgerald's photo album, which the University of South Carolina has. It's one of those albums, I know I grew up with it. Um, the photos are, black and white photos are pasted on the black paper, so it's crumbling. And incredibly, they let me handle it. I write in my book about how much influence New York City had on The Great Gatsby, how much it owes to being a New York novel. The last photo in the Fitzgerald's album, when they come back at last from Europe in 1931, and by then Zelda has had her first hospitalizations for schizophrenia. You know, life is, start, is really going downhill for the Fitzgeralds. The last photograph is this unfocused image of the Statue of Liberty, which, would have, which was new in 1931. And someone, Scott or Zelda, maybe Scotty, has written the words home again around the Statue of Liberty. Oops. Because I talk so much about water <laughs> in, my, in the first chapter of my book and going under and the fear of being pulled under, I love the fact that the Fitzgeralds in their albums took so many images of divers. I don't know who that is. It could be Scott, it could be Zelda, could be someone whose name is lost to history, but it's very atmospheric. Um, again, from the Fitzgerald's albums, that's, of course, Scott Fitzgerald holding little Scotty above the waves um, on the Riviera. That's the summer that he was working on Gatsby. He was revising Gatsby. I found a letter, by the way, in the University of South Carolina archives from 1924 it's dated a few days before the Fitzgeralds leave Great Neck to go to the Riviera for the first time. And Fitzgerald tells the person he's writing to that he's just finished Gatsby, that he's just finished working on Gatsby. And he says, it's an experiment in, and you can't quite make out that word. <laughs> it's either form, which I think it's probably what it is. It's an experiment in form, farce or force. People vote for different things. It's on a fold in the letter. It's in his handwriting. There are cigarette burns in the letter. I've shown it to other Fitzgerald experts. I think we pretty much vote for form, but what a, that letter has not been collected anywhere. 
um, I put it in my book because it was, it was found too late to be collected in any of the editions of Fitzgerald's letters. Um, this is also from the Fitzgerald's album. I love that image of Zelda. Almost every photo I see of Zelda, whether she looks beautiful or not so beautiful, she, she almost always looks uncomfortable to me in photographs. And in that image from her own album, she's kind of mugging for the camera. She's fooling around. And um, Scott and Scotty. This is heartbreaking. This is also in the University of South Carolina's archives. Um, that's the briefcase that F. Scott Fitzgerald had when he was in Hollywood. It's a leather briefcase. I got to hold it. Very beat up. And what's heartbreaking about it is Fitzgerald goes to Hollywood in 1937. He dies there of probably his third heart attack in 1940. You see he's had his name engraved in gold on the briefcase, but his address is the address of the Scribner's Building in New York. That was his only permanent address. He's moving around to furnished apartments all the time that he's in Hollywood. He doesn't have a permanent address. So, you know, I think of this, you know, our, one of our greatest American authors, and that's the only address he can put on his briefcase. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, it, this, the uh, Princeton University Library has Fitzgerald's scrapbook that he kept of the great Gatsby. He pastes all the reviews in there, notices about the play which came out on Broadway in 1926, notices about the silent film. He even puts in the bad reviews, you know, Fitzgerald's latest, a dud. An anonymous cartoonist, I had a researcher working on this, but we could never find out where this newspaper cartoon was published or who did it. The signature is really hard to make out. I love it because he, he gives us the climax of The Great Gatsby in one frame. There's the car driven by Daisy. Myrtle is being run over, right? Um, Miss, Mr. Wilson is committing suicide. And there's Jay Gatsby. So it's, it's jaunty. It's funny. It's the way they read it in the popular press as this kind of you know, over-the-top crime story. So I, I very much wanted to respect Gatsby, but also try to chip away at some of the fossilized great books criticism that we live with, because I wanted to try to also read it the way it was first read in 1925. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And Yes, yes. Did it, do I think Nick Carraway is an unreliable narrator? I think he's, he is in part an unreliable narrator because he so loves and, and, and reveres Gatsby. So you're getting Nick's bias. You know? Remember in the, in the opening pages of the novel he says, Gatsby was all right in the end. It was what foul dust preyed upon him. So he's an unrepentant Gatsby partisan. Um, the very end of the novel, remember he comes at night, it's a, it's a double for the opening of the novel, the opening scene. Nick goes at night to sort of say farewell to Gatsby's mansion. And as he says, some rude boys have written a, a nasty word on Gatsby's house, on the white marble of Gatsby's house, and he erases it. Get, that's kind of what Nick does, I think, in this novel. He erases the blots on Gatsby's character and gives us this, you know, unapologetic love letter to the lost friend. By the way, that's another way in which the novel is so over-designed. 
Everybody except Daisy in this novel is reaching out for somebody who's beyond their grasp. Nick is reaching for Gatsby. Gatsby is reaching for Daisy. Myrtle Wilson is reaching for Tom. Tom I mean, you can just go down the list. It's, it's crazy. Thank you. Uh, the question is, does the book endure in your mind because of the beautiful writing or because it epitomizes the American dream? And if it's the latter, uh, in a way, it implies the American dream is ultimately tragic. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to choose between the language and the message. <laughs> I'm going to say it's because, uh, because of how Fitzgerald presented that message. So it's both. I mean, I, the language, I think, and many other people do too, is, is especially the last seven pages of The Great Gatsby, the most powerful and beautiful words anybody has ever written about America. Fitzgerald has it both ways. He says the dream is tragic. He says you're going to get pulled under. He says it's kind of a mirage, but he writes about that dream in words that make it irresistible. And when you think about the last words of the novel that my title riffs on, so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past, well, that suggests, of course, that you can't escape the past, but isn't it noble to try? That's that's part of what those words are saying. So we beat on. I love the fact that he used that verb. Boats against the current. That's the best in what used to be called our national character, that we beat on, we try. We try to be better. So I think he has it both ways. Yes. <laughs> I'm waiting for the man with the mic. <laughs> Yeah. And many of the tragedy and the water yeah. images. Yeah. So how does that stack up to the great Gatsby? Um, well, I, in my humble opinion, I mean, Gatsby is amazing. Gatsby seems to come out of nowhere in, a, in, in one way, in one sense. It's so much better <laughs> than The Beautiful and the Damned, than This Side of Paradise, 1920, which is how Fitzgerald, you know, broke upon the scene, the literary scene. It gets published in 1920, and Fitzgerald and Zelda are become the toasts of New York. And they, def you know, he defines the age of the flapper, the jazz age, with the beautiful and damned, uh, with uh, this side of paradise. And then beautiful and damned is his New York novel, specifically about a marriage that's falling apart. They can't hold a candle to Gatsby. S for me, that was part of the mystery. How do, how, how do books like Gatsby happen? Some of Fitzgerald's short stories around the time he was writing Gatsby give us a clue. Um, the Rich Boy, Winter Dreams, Absolution, even earlier. They're, what, they're part of what's called the Gatsby cluster of short stories, where he seems to be trying out this idea of someone, usually a poor boy, reaching for, for a, a girl out of his grasp. You know, but it's not even Daisy, it's not even that girl, it's something else commensurate with, to his capacity for wonder you know, that, that he's reaching for. So I love to think about the fact that here we get Fitzgerald, who's writing a lot for magazines like the Saturday Evening Post. That's where he made his bread and butter. That's where he made his fortune in the early 20s writing these novels um, that are okay, but I don't think we'd still be reading them today were it not for The Great Gatsby. And then, you, you know, you get Tender as the Night. Some of you will hate me for saying this. I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a noble failure. I don't think it's quite there. Um, and then who knows what it would have happened with The Loves of the Last Tycoon. That was the novel he was working on at his death. It was unfinished at his death. It, he said he wanted to make it condensed and patterned like Gatsby. It's a Hollywood novel, and I think it's really interesting, but it's not finished. 
I think the letters, some of the short stories, and the crack up essays, his autobiographical essays and the crack up, and Gatsby, I mean, those are the masterpieces. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And I wondered if you would comment on changes in curricula where the word English is excised, mm-hmm. where high school is now language arts mm-hmm. or even reading, where novels are yeah. drawn so that nonfiction takes precedence, and what would happen, do you think, yeah. if the great Gatsby and other American novels were not taught? Oh, gosh. Oh, thank you. I, um, let's make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> let's really work to make sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the question or the comment is, um, this kind lady has been teaching the great Gatsby teacher for 10 years, and, and she's asked me to comment on some of the changes in curricula that we're experiencing across America, where it seems like rather than literature, high school teachers in particular, middle school teachers are being asked to, to teach language arts, more nonfiction rather than fiction. Um, One of the things I do at the end of the book is to survey college curricula uh, in America. Mostly I go to the Ivy League, but I take a look at some of the colleges that were important to Fitzgerald and St. Olaf's, which is mentioned in the novel. Um, You know, there is a lot of of nonsense out there. I'm going to be the unrepentant canon defender here. I think, um, I think that we need to get our, what many of us consider the great books under our belt before we digress, before we play with them, before we disagree and say, no, they're not so great, you know? And that, does, that doesn't just mean books by dead white men. That means Beloved by Toni Morrison, which is a great book. That means Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, which is a very tough novel to teach but I do it in freshman English because where else are students going to read it if they don't read it then? I mean, I think that's part of our work, that we've got to do the tough stuff because people don't just pick up these novels later in life unless something amazing happens to them. And unfortunately, you get this in high school, you get it in college, you know, Part of what's happened, at least I can speak in colleges and universities, is that teaching has become a popularity contest. And so if you don't, if you make students work really hard and, you know, they're not grateful to you for staying up all night reading Invisible Man or Moby Dick or The Great Gatsby, and your numbers start to plummet, uh, your ratings start to plummet, you know, if your job isn't protected, you have to start to worry. It's not a great system. I'm not happy about it. And I think that, um, I certainly know that Fitzgerald wouldn't have been happy about it, judging from the books that he kept recommending people read. I think we need to stretch out our, our arms farther and, and, and reach higher as readers, as well as everything else we do. So that's my crank response to what you said. And by the way, in, in case I run out of time, I also want to make sure to thank Eric Frazier from the Rare Books Room here at the Library of Congress, which is such a beautiful space. Um, if you've never been there and you have any occasion to go to look at the ASCs, we, the Library of Congress has the only complete collection in the world. Um, it, it, it's, it's really such a treasure and such a, a gift to be able to do research in Washington, D.C. and have all of this at our fingertips. One, Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to know how you compare just this paragraph alone about the careless people. It was all very careless and confused. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their own money. 
or their carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together. That's our system. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You knew that question was coming. <laughs> well, I just want to say one or two words about the prescience of Gatsby. Um, students are always fascinated by this. The way the novel seems to predict the Great Depression. The lights go out in Gatsby's mansion in the third act, and the great national party is about to come to an end, and almost like Fitzgerald sort of knew it. The way the novel predicts the details of Fitzgerald's own first funeral when he was buried in a Protestant cemetery in Rockville in the rain. About 15 people showed up. The minister who buried him didn't know who he was. That's in, in uh, Scotty's memoir that wasn't published. So it's, it's amazing how he does seem to look forward to things. Um, you had a second. <laughs> Hemingway, um, I love Hemingway's writing. It's hard for me now to talk about Hemingway without saying something about what a bastard he was to Fitzgerald <laughs> and to so many other people. I mean, he's so mean to Fitzgerald. And, Heming and Fitzgerald's the one who hooked Hemingway up with, with Maxwell Perkins, with Scribner's. Um, when Fitzgerald got a glowing review about The Great Gatsby from the literary critic Gilbert Seldes in The Dial, the kind of review as a writer you, that just makes your, your year if you get this review, Hemingway said to Fitzgerald, too bad about that review. Now it's going to ruin you for writing any other novel. You know, he just loved to do that kind of thing. Hemingway's language is funny. It's, it's more pared down. I mean, a lot of people will argue that Hemingway started to write hard-boiled prose before people, writers such as Dashiell Hammett, that you know, it's kind of neck and neck, this attempt to get American speech on the page and tough guy speech. Um, and yet at the same time, I think Hemingway is more enamored of kind of the biblical stuff, you know, the biblical uh, cadences and references than Fitzgerald is. And I'm especially thinking, of course, of The Old Man and the Sea, which I had to read three times before I graduated college. I'm thinking, though, of, you know, The Sun Also Rises, which gets its title from Ecclesiastes. There's a way in which I feel that Fitzgerald is much more modern by the time you get to Gatsby, not in the earlier novels, but by the time you get to Gatsby, then Hemingway is. Of course, Hemingway got the Nobel Prize. Faulkner got the Nobel Prize. Fitzgerald, number of prizes he got in his lifetime, zero. <laughs> it's tough being a writer. <laughs> Gertrude Stein loved it. That Fitzgerald, yes. That probably killed their relationship, that Gertrude Stein told Hemingway that Fitzgerald was the better writer. Yeah. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.